So when you squeeze an orange, you expect to get orange juice from that orange. You would be very surprised if you squeezed an orange and out came apple juice or grape juice or pomegranate juice, you know. So you know what you're gonna get when you squeeze an orange. And why do you get orange juice from squeezing an orange? Well, simply because that's what's inside. So let's take that same understanding and apply it to ourselves. So if somebody upsets you, somebody makes you angry, somebody hurts you, somebody does something to offend you in some way, shape, or form, what comes out of you and why? So if anger, frustration, hate, if all that crap starts pouring out of you because somebody did something to offend you in some way, shape, or form, well, that's what's inside. Here's the thing about what's inside, is it's not just there temporarily from time to time. It's always there, just like in the orange. The orange juice is always in the orange. And whatever hateful shit comes pouring out of your mind in a moment of stress or upset, that's what's living inside you. Now, I'm not telling you this to shame you and make you feel bad about yourself, and quite, quite the contrary. I'm just pointing it out because I think oftentimes we believe, you know, that we uh, are in a pretty good frame of mind. But it's when you're squeezed and you see what comes out that you have the opportunity to identify those areas where you have opportunity to improve. And I know that sounds like corporate speak, you get the opportunity to improve. <laughs> I remember hearing that a lot when I had my old job. But uh, so with lifting, for example, you know, after I lifted for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, trying to get growth out of the same old muscles and the same old exercises just wasn't happening. You know, so if I wanted to add more muscle mass to my body, I had to find my areas of opportunity, you know? Those rear delts, oh, there's an opportunity there. You didn't work on those very much. Maybe uh, um, spend a little time on that. Maybe start working the traps a little bit. Maybe doing some more trap bar deadlifts, that sort of thing. But uh, I had to get creative with how I approached my problem because the same old exercises weren't working. And I think that in life, when it comes to your frame of mind, your state of happiness, your success in life overall, you've got to start with that frame of mind. You've got to start with what comes out when you're squeezed. When you see what's coming out when you're squeezed, it shows you where your opportunities are. And that's why <laughs> we're going to talk about ex-wives, because ex-wives are, for many guys, the ultimate squeeze. These are people who you have a lot of emotional trauma with. Maybe a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of, a lot of very justifiable reasons to be pissed off. However, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because she isn't gonna be harmed by you being pissed off. She's not gonna be upset with you being hateful. She doesn't care. It doesn't matter to her. In fact, it doesn't matter to anybody but to you, because you're living in this cesspool of emotion. You're the one that has to deal with it day in and day out. And then the people around you who accidentally trigger you for some minor incursion, minor offense, are gonna be getting the wrath that you have built up inside you from all this unsqueezed negative juice that you're just carrying around with you. So how do you get that negative juice out? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. One of the things I really love about dogs is they're very in tune with emotional states. Not just the people, but other animals. They, they definitely pick up on um, the emotional frequency of others. And I think that is an amazing um, characteristic that dogs have really, really honed, especially in their interactions with people. 
but they definitely pick up on it from other dogs too. I know that when I'm walking by another dog, if that dog has a lot of anxiety or is upset or is, you know, whatever, afraid, um, my dogs get a heightened sense of, a, of anxiety and fear and they can behave badly. So I don't like small children coming up to them because oftentimes, even though small children can be very curious and sweet, sometimes they can also be very afraid of the dog. And if the dog picks up on fear, well, they might become fearful themselves, which then makes them, you know, a little bit unpredictable. But emotional frequency is something that I think is really critical to this conversation because understanding the frequency of your own emotions gives you a real insight into how they're impacting you and how you can change them and how you can control them, I should say. So I think it really helps if we look at emotional states of mind and think of them as frequencies. And we just to really keep this simple, we'll go from zero to 10, where zero is the lowest frequency or the lowest frame of mind, or emotional state of mind, and 10 is the best or the highest. So at 10, you've got feelings like love and compassion, while at zero, you've got like self-loathing and um, shame. And between them, you've got, you know, say at five, you've got just sort of this neutral kind of experience where you're not really feeling anything at all. You're sort of um, in a state of maybe uh, pleasantly, you know, just existing, you know. Um, above that might be, uh, you know, you feel nice, you, you feel pleasant, you feel, you know, relatively happy. And it goes up from happy to joy to bliss to compassion and love. And going down, you know, perhaps you've got, um, you know, uncomfortable, you know, you feel uh, disappointed, you feel angry, you know, you feel um, shame, you feel self-loathing. And I know there's a lot more emotions I could put in there. We could take this all the way up to 100. I mean, there's so many more that we could put in there. But I just want to give you a general layout of what the landscape of these emotions looks like. Because um, when you see yourself expressing an emotion that is on the negative side of the spectrum, you have to stop and reflect on, okay, where is that coming from? Because that's, that's not helping anybody. I mean, in, in fact, it, in actuality, it's making your life miserable. Whether you know it or not, you're carrying this shit around with you all the time and it's affecting everything that you do. Yeah, it may be tucked away in some compartment in your brain or in your heart or whatever and you don't access it on a regular basis. And you think that because you're ignoring it, it's okay, it's not gonna bother you. But it's sort of like having some radioactive material in your house that's just radiating all of this um, cancer-causing uh, gas all the time. And because you've got it locked away in a closet, you think, ah, it's fine, I don't need to worry about it. But no, that, that radiation is still affecting you all the time. Just because you're not touching it, you're not seeing it, you're not you know, manipulating it, you're not actually interacting with it in that moment, doesn't mean it's not killing you, it is. Emotional states of mind manifest themselves into physical behaviors. So externally, like when you are angry at your wife, you know, you might experience anger and frustration. You might be um, disappointed. You might be pissed off. You might be, um, you might feel rage. That's a good one. Um, but then you're not, you, you've watched a football game, so you're not thinking about her. Now you're pleasantly in this experience of you're having a nice time. Maybe you're having a drink. Maybe you're stuffing your face with some junk and you think you're fine. But no, you're not because you know that negativity is still there. You're still just very vaguely aware of it all the time. A commercial comes on with a woman that looks like your ex. Ugh, it triggers it just a tiny bit. You hear a woman say something, you know, that um, reminds you of something that she would have said. It triggers it. It's always there. And the more you ignore it, the worse it gets because it goes from manifesting as external outward bursts of emotion um, into diseases. So it turns into most commonly cancer. Um, when you're holding back that kind of negativity, you are just basically creating a state where your body is in a constant fight or flight 
you know, um, sympathetic nervous system uh, at, at a low level. The sympathetic nervous system was, does, you know, part of our, our evolution in that it saves our lives when things are, you know, scary. Like you know, we're being chased by a bear or we're, you know, standing on top of a skyscraper, you know, we're a thousand feet up and we're staring down and that sympathetic nervous system says, be careful, don't fall, you know, run from the bear. It's that fight or flight mechanism. Well, that sympathetic nervous system, um, once it's triggered, when you give it an emotion like anger, um, uh, you're, you're, you're activating it. Anger, um, fear, uh, sadness, um, uh, depression, anxiety, all of these things triggered that sympathetic nervous system to some degree. And so long as that nervous system is, is triggered, you are going to be um, creating an environment where your body and your mind is becoming more and more sick. That's why a lot of old men in particular get really, really rigid in their belief systems. It's because they're afraid to think of anything else. They're afraid that if they let their thoughts go outside of what's been tried and true, they will um, lose their identity. Um, that's how a lot of people end up watching the same you know, cable news channel all the time. It's because they just want to hear back what they believe. They don't want to stretch their mind out to consider another possibility. It's fear. Plain and simple, it's fear. So how do you turn it around? Oh, there's something. Whew. Yeah, the bugs are pretty bad out here today. I need to stand in the shade to try to get away from them. So how do you turn this thing around? Well, first of all, you've got to become aware of the emotions as they're happening. And then you can't do much in the middle of it because your, your energy's all up. You know, you're going to be um, unable to think. So when your sympathetic nervous system is turned on, it drives blood away from your brain and it drives it towards your limbs. So your ability to think through a problem when your sympathetic nervous system is activated is very, very minor. You're not going to be able to do anything with that. So you've got to get to a place where your parasympathetic nervous system is turned on, and that's the rest and relax. That's why people tend to um, enjoy meditation, is because it puts them in this rest and relax frame of mind and it allows them to think more clearly. I think that's why these walks are so helpful for me, as I get into a rest and relax kind of state of mind, it allows me to um, think more clearly and be less likely to um, activate that sympathetic nervous system. So what I would recommend for you is find some way that you can rest and relax and not with the television on. You can't have distractions. You gotta just be kind of in a quiet space with your own thoughts and put yourself in a place where you're able to really, really relax. Imagine uh, a place where you can go that's, you know, um, peaceful, you know, like in nature, you know, at the beach, um, wherever you like. Try to imagine that experience or actually find that place and go there and sit down and just soak it in and just let yourself rest and relax. And then replay from that relaxed perspective, objectively, what happened. Why did you react? Where is that coming from? What benefit does it have for you? Um, at the end of the day, when you get right down to it, at some point, no matter how bad it's been, no matter what someone has done to you, no matter what it is, I don't care if they, they stabbed you, I don't care if they tried to kill you, I don't care if they, they, they killed your mother, it doesn't matter. At some point, you must forgive them. Not because they need forgiving, but because you need to forgive. And if you don't forgive, you're gonna carry around this state of mind that's causing you pain and leading to your own demise every day and it's always going to be there and you're always going to be dealing with it. The only way you get out of it is through a forgiveness process. Um, and it's not going to happen fast. I mean, you can start off saying, okay, I forgive you, I forgive you, but that's not going to work. You've got to actually see the experience from the other person's perspective, not that they are justified in their behavior, but just that they are a human being 
and you just need to have compassion for them as a human being. That's it. You just need to understand that they were reacting as a human being under these circumstances because they were afraid, because they were coming from an unloving place, because they were behaving less than ideally for themselves, that they they have a lot of lessons to learn in life. They have a long way to go before they can reach real happiness. And if they're behaving this way, the pain they must have is probably enormous because hurt people hurt people. We've all heard that. And if your ex hurt you, there's a really good chance that she's carrying around an awful lot of pain. So rather than condemning her for being a hurt person and then um, carrying around all this pain and becoming a hurt person yourself, to prevent you from hurting yourself and anyone else, just let it go. Don't carry it around anymore, just let it go. Forgive yourself and forgive others. Forgiving yourself is the hardest thing to do because we always hold ourselves accountable, especially as men, we're very critical of our own behaviors. But you gotta, you gotta let it go. You can't carry that shit around. It will literally manifest into something that um, will, will cause you a great deal of harm in your life. I gotta get out of here, these bugs are just crazy. So walking through this forest was huge for my personal healing journey following divorce. But you have to remember that the divorce was just one step on a path of, I don't know, like getting, you know, you ever imagine what it was like to get in the ring with Mike Tyson, you know, back when he was at his peak? Guy was just unstoppable. I mean, he was... He seemed like it was unfair that he fought anybody in a ring. It just seemed unfair because he was just so unbelievably powerful and fast. Anyway, he'd get the guy in the corner and just start unloading on him. And it seemed like the guy was defenseless. He just couldn't do anything. That's kind of what my life felt like for about, I don't know, five or six years. Where it just seemed like one punch after another, after another, after another. And... The divorce was just one of those punches. And learning to uh, adapt your thinking to a series of events that are out of your control to some extent. I mean, you don't have control, complete control of these things, whatever they are, but they just keep happening over and over and over again. And they're happening to you. So on some level, you've got to be responsible for it you got to accept responsibility for it because only you can respond to it. Well, walking through this forest gave me the peace of mind to get into that parasympathetic state of mind where I could hear my thoughts. And if you just listen quietly to the forest, it's just... I mean, you guys can't quite understand how, how insanely beautiful it actually is. Because it's not just the sign, you know, the, the way it appears, the, the colors and the sounds. It's also there's a smell and there's a, there's a frequency to it as well. You know, there's an energy to the forest that you feel when you're in it. There's a, I don't know how to put it, but there's, there's definitely an energy to it. And uh, granting yourself access to that energy where you can uh, immerse yourself in it. And just not think about anything. Just let your brain go blank. Just don't even think. Just, just breathe in and just appreciate how beautiful it is. It's amazing how all these wonderful thoughts come into your head and how you start to see clearly your own life from a more objective standpoint. It's like you're, instead of being up close and personal with it, you're like at 30 or 40 or 50,000 feet looking down on yourself and you can see the path and how you got here and you might even be able to see where you're headed. It changes everything. It changes um, how you interact with everyone on a daily basis. And by making those little adjustments, those just being kinder, just being more loving, being more compassionate, being more thoughtful, being more um, available for your, the people you care about. It changes everyone else's life. It changes the destiny of all of their lives. 
So now your life is going in a better direction and all of their lives are going in better directions and they're drawn to you. They're compelled to be with you. They want to be with you. So find a place where you can go and you can flip into that rest and relax parasympathetic nervous system, clear your head and just allow the positive thoughts to come and just watch how your frequency changes. This does not happen from walking in the woods one day. It might, but it probably won't. For me, I've been walking in these forests for more than 10 years. So that's 3,650 days. <laughs> and I would walk probably two or three times a day. So that's 10,000 walks. That's 10,000 walks. That's a good title for a book. But uh, yeah, that's how you turn it around. And it doesn't just affect you in the moment, it affects you from now on. Like it affects everything. Everything in your life just gets better. So the way you identify your emotions on that scale, and like I said, that number could go to 100. I mean, there's so many different emotions. Is, and the way you adjust them, the way you change your state of mind, just change your frequency, is by just finding a thought that is slightly better than the place you're at now. So if you're at the bottom, like you're in self-loathing, even feeling a little shameful is probably better than hating yourself. And if you're in shame, being angry is better than being ashamed. And if you're, if you're angry, being a little irritated is definitely better than being angry. And if you're a little irritated, just getting back to a state of neutral, like you don't care, like you're kind of apathetic about it, whatever the issue is, like fine, it's whatever it is. That's better than being a little irritated. And being, feeling okay about it, feeling pleasant about something, being in a state of acceptance is a much better place than just being neutral. And feeling comfortable, maybe even happy, is better than feeling just accepted. And if you can get to a place where you're feeling compassionate or love, or you're feeling one of those really high frequency emotions toward that person that you're angry at or have been, had a problem with, that person who squeezed you, compassion is probably the best way to put it because love has so many other connotations. But if you can get to a place where you can compassionately see the humanity of that other person in that experience and how they acted without judgment and just understand as a human being, they experienced something and they reacted to it in a way that was probably less than ideal. If you can get to that place and you can even get to the place where you imagine that if they had the opportunity to relive that whole situation, that maybe they would have chosen differently. Maybe they would have behaved better. Maybe they would have acted differently. Now you're starting to change your frequency. Now you're starting to actually get to a place where you're healing. And in that healing place, you undo all the damage that you've done. You, everything that's happened in the past, all the things that you may have done yourself that caused either yourself or someone else pain, through that process of healing yourself and forgiving yourself and getting to that compassionate frame of mind, you literally undo it all. So that's the goal, is to get there. Get to that place where you can feel compassion and even love for that other person who squeezed you, who pulled out that, that anger. Because in reality, all that person was doing was being your teacher. They were just showing you where you had opportunities for improvement. And that's sort of what your ex-wife is. She's a teacher. And I know that's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of you guys. And I know, I, I know that's a tough one. But it's because you're still in a place of anger. You're still in a place of resentment. You're still in a place of maybe even um, hate. You know, you're in that negative energy place. But if you can get to a place where you have compassion for her and you can understand her behaviors on, from her perspective, you don't have to endorse them. It's not about agreeing what she did. It's just knowing that as a human being, we're flawed and human beings you know, they, we do, especially when we're hurt and we feel afraid, we, we do things that aren't necessarily good. We, we, we behave in bad ways. We behave in ways that we later regret. That's probably the best way to put it. 
All right, you guys, I think that's all I can say on that. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please like and subscribe. If you think someone that you know would benefit from hearing this information, please forward this video to them. I'll see you in the next one. Stay healthy. And if you can, stay single.